So this morning, we're going to talk about the Great Commission. This morning is not going to be a normal average sermon that you're used to having with me or something that you've ever had before, maybe. I don't know. But this morning, I'm doing some things a little different. And the reason why is that it's more of a conversation about where we're going this year as a church and where we as the elder team have had discussions about where we see ourselves sitting in three years as a church. And it's more of a fireside chat with a little bit of discussion and interaction, maybe, from you all if you want it. But I want to read to you some scriptures first, because the Great Commission, I think, is something that's talked about a lot, but not necessarily done a lot. Let me say that again. I think the Great Commission is talked about a lot, but I don't think it's done a lot. Matter of fact, with a show of hands, I would like to poll the audience, and it's not a bad answer. You can't, but like, don't feel embarrassed by this. But as a child, were you taught how to make a disciple? Raise your hand if, as a child, you were not taught how to make a disciple. Good, raise your hand. You were not taught as a child how to make a disciple. Okay, good, go. Okay. Some of you have. That's awesome. As an adult, do you feel comfortable taking someone that doesn't know Jesus and walking with them to their grave as they come into knowing Jesus and being beside them until they go one day to see heaven? Raise your hand if you're totally comfortable with that. A couple of you. All right. Now, see, this is my point that I'd like to make today, and when I talk to the elders about this concept of being a Great Commission church, I would love for us in three years that we would feel comfortable engaging our faith to walk with anyone. And this morning I want to talk about that and engage on this subject because the Great Commission is what Jesus left us. It is this moment that he says to us as his people that it is for what we should be doing as the church. And I want to explain this to you in this way, and I want to read this to you right now. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, that sounds like today. Many people gather on a Sunday morning and worship, but sometimes we have doubts. Sometimes we wonder if God's there. There's a reality to that. So we can relate here. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now we see this account in Matthew of the Great Commission. We've talked about the Great Commission before. We've, we've had interactions on it before. But what I want to ask this question this morning is, and really to understand and to think about this, I really want to say first that when Jesus leaves the earth, there's an expectation from God that there will be a lineage and a passion of the Holy Spirit. Now, in these days of COVID, it's easy for us, I think, if we think about this way, that the Holy Spirit is like an infectious, breathable virus. That if you've got it in you, and the Holy Spirit is in you, and you're engaging with Jesus, and you're engaging in it, and you're doing these things, something pops out. And I would hope that if we were within 20 feet, the Holy Spirit is infectious coming out of you. Amen? Oh, come on now. Let me say it this way, maybe we'll get a little more excited. I think, I know, that when I'm around someone that has a joyous attitude, it rubs off on me. Amen? Matter of fact, when I'm feeling down, there's certain people that if I interact with them, I feel a little better. Anybody ever experienced that one? Matter of fact, no, 
you shared about that with Lydia. How after a service, you knew that she was there. You have a little encouragement, even if you laid it a little flat. I love when you said that, because I, I, I think that's important for us to hear, is that we all know sometimes how important we are as an encourager. And I want to say this, too, that if the Holy Spirit, that if we look at this, what are we actually breathing out? And if you can think of this phrase, and I've, I've taught this before, but I really want us to hear this again, and that is, Jesus is Lord. Say it with me. Jesus is Lord. One more time. Jesus is Lord. That, I think, is important for us to understand. See, Jesus is setting this up in the Great Commission as being a disciple of Him. Not a disciple of John, not a disciple of Paul. But great, all their teachings are great. And we soak up everything that happens in the New Testament. But all of their teachings and everything still goes back to Jesus. So if you read what Paul writes, he's still writing as a disciple of Jesus. So all these things are coming down from Jesus because Jesus is Lord. I think sometimes we forget that Jesus is Lord. I think we love Jesus as our best buddy. I think sometimes he has his different personalities to us, but at the end of the day, he is Lord. And the fact is, is that if he is lording over our lives, there are things that start to happen in us because as we follow his teachings, as we be like Jesus, we will have a serving attitude. Now, if we think about for a moment, this, this thing happens with Jesus and the disciples. He leaves the earth and in Acts, I want to read to you out of Acts because this gets interesting too. The beginning of Acts, it says, In my former book, Philopius, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit and the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up in the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back. In the same way you see him going to heaven. So often we forget the power and the authority that Jesus has in our world. We forget the power and authority that He's given to us through the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, I think most of us on average forget how much we actually can do on this earth for the glory and kingdom of heaven. Because I think we get caught up being disciples of other things. Or other institutions. For instance, how about if I sing this song, tell me what ends at it. Let me see if you know this jingle. Da 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 da! I'm loving it. All right. If I give you this logo phrase, this motto, just do it. Mikey, all right? Matter of fact, what's the logo for Wawa? A bird, that's right. I could go down through corporate logos and jingles all day long with you, and there are things you even remember because of good marketing. The fact is, Jesus has no marketing firm. Jesus' Lord is you. 
this beautiful concept that you see here, when, when institutions start to rise up, we start to see that you're about conquering for the institution. So, for instance, when we talk about an institution, we think about Wawa. Do I stop that this morning? Their coffee's good. Not as good as others, but it's okay. I really like other things that they have there. And I can sit here and tell you all the beautiful things about Wawa, right? The Turkey Gobbler. Simply amazing creation. I could go on and on and tell you all these beautiful things about Wawa, but at the end of the day, you will never know if it's true or not until you try it out, right? Matter of fact, when you look at Wawa, if I take you along with me, you will be able to experience the joy of Wawa. And over time, you will start to be indoctrinated in the Wawa. You'll get their app, you'll get the gift cards, and boom, you're off to the races. And you'll never look back. And you'll have someone else join in with you, and next thing you know, there's all these Wawaites around. And you're wondering, how did I ever get into Wawa? Because I remember when they were just a convenience store. And see, institutionalizing people is what humans do well. It's called conquering. And when Jesus started out, and Jesus is Lord, it's not about conquering the world for Christ. It's about serving the world as Christ. I think that's hard for us sometimes to picture because, see, church in 300 AD, something shifted with Constantine when the Roman government said everyone's going to be a Christian. All of a sudden, it's not Jesus is Lord, but Caesar is Lord. And there's something that happens where you're not making disciples anymore, you're making converts. And all of a sudden, there I am at Camp Meadowland, and I'm more concerned about a kid saying a prayer that he goes to heaven, and I never talk to him anymore. But I thought I did good. But in reality, it's walking with people in their daily lives and being in faith community with them and the Holy Spirit and being Jesus to others. And it's not about just helping people, but showing them in their spiritual lives how my spiritual life and their spiritual life, as we connect with the Holy Spirit, something happens. And we start to realize that there is something beautiful and wondrous. So I want you to think about this, and I want you to catch this. We serve in the kingdom. We don't conquer. Matter of fact, it's hard sometimes to wrap our heads around, but every church that exists out there should be serving God. I mean, we're actually all in it together. But yet, for some reason, it's hard for us sometimes to wrap our heads around that because there's so many differences. Because when people open up the Bible, they start to interpret, they start to look at things, they start to skew it, and next thing you know, they're going down these paths and we're separated. But yet, if we could all come together and say, Jesus is Lord, and get back into that centering, something beautiful can happen. See, I wonder, do you wake up in the morning and realize that Jesus is Lord in your life? Or are you hoping that it just makes it a good day for you? And I've been there. There are some days I don't want to serve God where I'm tired out, I'm worn out, and I wouldn't mind Him taking me home. I'm up for, the, like, the next half of the life, right? But the fact is, is that we're in our eternal life now. Like, it's here now. Like, we don't, we don't have eternal life later. We're in it now. If we are following after Jesus, and if we're going after it, we're in it. Let's just be phase two. So, church, this morning, I would like to cast a picture for you. And over the next two weeks here and the rest of the month, we're going to be exploring what it means to be a Great Commission church. But I want to paint a picture for you, if I could, and that is, Jesus was all about relationships. If we watch Jesus in his ministry, and as we get back into Mark in February, we're going to have a little different lens as we keep looking at Jesus' ministry applying to us. But when you look at Jesus, he did everything very relationally. It wasn't a classroom setting. It wasn't whipping out the book and going down to point A, B, C, and D. 
hand it off to you, you go home, and now you apply it to cycles. No, he walked with them. There was an interaction. There was engagement. And what we notice with Jesus is that he built a ministry team. Okay? Now I want to cast a little vision here for our church. And maybe some of you this morning will go, Scott, I love it. Sign me up. I'm going to talk to you later. Others of you would say, I'm running for the hill, Scott. I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not going to talk to you about it. Either church is fine. But I want to throw something out to you all here that I think is broken in most American churches. And that is, we have children's ministries. We spend a lot of time and effort. We have adults that pour in the children and do these beautiful things like faith formation and Sunday school class and club programs and DBS. And I mean, how many, raise your hand if you've ever served in a children's ministry at one point in your life. Raise your hand. Okay, see, most of us, all of you raise your hand. Now watch this one. Youth ministry comes along, and that becomes a little more specialized because, frankly, teenagers can get frustrated. Most of the time, teenagers are frustrated because you remember how you were. You remember how frustrating you were. <laughs> so therefore, you don't want to be around them, right? So now watch this. How many of you have served in a teen ministry at any point in your life? All right, got a good number of hands, but notice the numbers went down a little. Now, adult ministry. See, people might think children are scary at times, or babies, and they have to change their diapers. Teenagers get a little scary because they start asking a lot of deeper questions and things, and they're wrestling, and there's some rebellion going, they're trying to find their way and their boundaries and their identity. But adults, adults, that's the age bracket that we spend the majority of our life in. Now, adult ministry, that's different. Walking with people in their daily lives, engaging with them, interacting with them on a regular basis, making sure they're okay. You're celebrating their joys. You're walking with them in their sorrows. Now, I want to raise your hands. How many of you have been on an adult ministries team? Now, I don't mean like the care team because they're handling physical needs I and mean, we do care for people. But I mean actually discipling, walking, mentoring as you would as a chill child or a youth worker. How many of you have done that with adult ministries? Raise your hand. Wait, can you raise them really high, please? Notice, there's only a couple hands. All right, thank you. And half of them were pastors. Do you see my point here, church? What's interesting is that we spend most of our time in organized ministry, usually with children and teens. But when it comes to adults, it gets hard. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a test, or a guess here, that... Because we grew up in children's ministry, we might have grown up in a teen ministry, it was easier for us to gravitate to those because we knew what it was about. Right? Makes sense? Want to say that? But adult ministry, whew, that's a whole different ballgame. So here's what I'm going to propose. I talked to the elder team about this. And they love this idea. And you're going to hear more about it, but I'm seeding it today. If you feel called at all, to disciple adults, to work with adults, to treat adults as if they were children or youth, and to form ministry around adult ministries of all ages, come see me. Because I'm looking to build a team of adults that want to go minister to other adults. It's just that simple. Because I believe that as families interact with us as a church, I believe that as teens come into our youth ministry, or kids come into our children's ministry, or there are families here with the preschool, that most of us actually don't know what to do with those families if we were to meet them. Now, we might know how to invite them over to our home for dinner. We might even know how to, like, prepare some meals for them if we hear there's a problem. But do we actually know how to go build spiritual relationships with them that are disciples? Now, I also know this. I tend not to want to do things without being taught how to do it. Does that make sense? Like, I would not like to go ride on a horse without being instructed how to. And I don't like hearing from the instructor, your horse might veer off the path for a while. What are we awkward? So I'm not looking to do that with an adult ministry. 
not looking to teach you or train you and have you go off on your own, and thunder will bring you back sometime. But what I am asking is, if you are interested at all, and if you pray about this at all, interested in engaging with adults that you might have never met before, but because they've been tied to our church somehow, you'd be willing to engage in building a relationship with them and getting your life a little messy, because you know that God is calling you to it, and see me. Because in February, I want to start training on this. I want to start working with this. Because here's the fact that I know about life. We do not do things naturally except bodily functions. And even that, we were taught how to properly do that. The fact is, in life, we are taught how to do things. We don't naturally wake up in the morning and go, Hey, God, I'm here and I'm ready to go love on your people on this earth. No, you're taught how to do that. You might have an inkling sometimes and have instinct to do things, but at the end of the day, you're taught. You're taught respect for your parents. You're taught how to drive. You're taught how to pray. You're taught how to read scripture. We're taught, 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 taught. But the best teaching out there that's ever been done ever is when the instructor and the student are side by side doing it together. I'm putting you on the spot. Being a butcher. Did you just open a book and read the book and then grab the knife and start cutting? How are you taught how to be a butcher? Hands on. With someone else guiding you in that process. So you were a disciple of the butcher that taught you how to butcher, correct? See, folks? It happens all the time. If we actually want to be effective and change the world with Jesus, it starts with us. We have incredible opportunities as a faith community to go do amazing things with Jesus. It's at our doorstep. There's 50 families that are tied to our preschool. Right there is a direct mission field. There's every place that everybody goes to work. There's mission fields everywhere. We are bumping into people all the time. So this week as we cast the vision of being a great commission church in our first step, I, w- I want to share this with you, and I want you to think about this and ponder this even today and talk about it at your dinner tables and your lunch tables today. Talk about it with friends you know that are believers. But I want to ask this question. What compels me to get closer to Christ? Or what compels you to get closer to Jesus? See, for me, it might be something I read, but a lot of times it's interacting with another human being that has sparked something in me. It might be something that they wrote, a testimony or engagement, but at the end of the day, I am finding in my life the number one thing that pushes me closer to Christ is relationships with other people. When another human life bumps in the mind, something happens. Positive or negative? A negative interaction might cause me to cry out to God and say, could you smite him, please? Because I get it. Or it might be, God, I love this person. Can I have more of them in my life? Like, people, when they bump into us, things happen. And the old, what I know is that when Jesus had people bump into him, things happen. And I know when people bump into me, things happen. And I wonder what happens in a world where relationships are on the decline, mental health issues are increasing like crazy right now. And I sit with a bunch of people that have interacted their lives with me and I'm encouraged every day. And I'm wondering if we have taken for granted the beauty of our faith community. Let me say it to you this way. A lot of times, we're so used to the meals coming when we're sick the cards coming in the mail for encouragement, 
or that little note from someone in church that says, hey, I was praying for you, or the fact that you can just have prayer and just engage people immediately and a body is praying for you. Just those little spiritual practices alone, we take for granted. Because a lot of us, we're so used to it that we don't realize the rest of the world doesn't have that. We meet people that don't have support systems. We meet people that they don't even know how to do life well because no one ever taught them. And yet for some reason here, we've been taught by those ahead of us how to be the church. And we do things that the rest of the world wants. If there was ever a time that our culture needed Jesus as their Lord, it is now. Let me say that again. If there was ever a time in our culture that they that people needed Jesus as their Lord, it is now. But see, here's the thing. People aren't going to wake up one morning on average and be like, so, God, you're out there. How do I get closer to you? It's possible. And God answers prayers. So if your co-worker woke up and was asking about how to get closer to God, and God responds, look for my people, I'll show you. What if you're that person? What if you're that person that's supposed to be Jesus to these other people in your workplace, but you're afraid to because you don't know how to because no one's ever taught you? And that's fair. And that's what we're talking about. Our goal as a church is that in, over a three-year period, everybody's going to be comfortable with this. This is what we're going to do. Because I promise you, this church has grown, will continue to grow, because we're going to keep pumping into people that need to be connected to God and connected with humans. Because that's what church is about. If someone ever asks you, hey, why do you go to church? It's real simple. Because Jesus is Lord. And you want to be connected to God and connected to His people so that you can go out and help other people be connected to God and His people. Does that make sense? Like, like church is easy. Like, if you really think about it, at the end of the day, what Jesus set up was really simple. Jesus said, be me, be Jesus, to others, like I was to others. And teach other people how to do that too. And the world will be a better place. And that is why church is good. Church at its core, when it's not about the institution, but it's about the kingdom and serving the Lord, it's beautiful. It's that sweet aroma like chocolate chip cookies. It's amazing what happens. So church, this week, spend time in prayer. Ask the Lord if it's your time now to step up in the spaces. And I'm not talking about adding more things to your schedule. I'm talking about engaging people where they're at around you. Because I promise you this. There are so many families and so many individuals that we're tied to as a church right now. I could keep every one of you busy with one household. Just loving on one household. Let alone all the connections that you have. The harvest is plenty and the workers are few. But over these next three years, and especially this year, this year is a year of equipping. We're going to talk more about that next week. But this is going to be a year of equipping for our church. I'm curious what it's going to look like when there's a teenager up here doing prayer time, not an adult. Or when the tech table is filled with teenagers and elementary school kids and middle school that running it. Because we taught them. Because I know plenty of middle school and elementary school kids are running their sound systems at their schools. See, I think sometimes we also, in the process, we forget who we're teaching and what we're training for. 
But the fact is, is that I started doing sound when I was in sixth grade because some guy in the church, not the pastor, taught me how to run sound. See, I'm sharing this with you because I can go time and time again after things I learned in church because some man or some woman took time to teach me. Even now, I'm learning how to do stuff in the church because people are taking time to teach me. So I want to close on this thought. Examine yourself in your spiritual walk this week. Is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Are you serving in the kingdom? Check yourself. Engage with that. If you want to talk about that, I'm always open. Gary's open. Give a buzz. Let's get together. Because I don't want anyone to walk out of here and face their week not realizing that they are a part of this beautiful thing called the kingdom of God. And that every day of your life, there are people that will love on you and care about you and walk with you and help you get closer to God and closer to others so that you can learn how to be Jesus to others around you. Because when you are Jesus to others around you, the world changes. Governments come and fall. Corporations come and fall. But the kingdom of God stays. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, as we start moving forward as a great commission church, Lord, to, to follow after what your son did on this earth, Lord, to be like Jesus, to claim to be in the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you so much for those that have gone before us that have laid that groundwork. Lord, I thank you for those that have been pastors of the church and laid this groundwork. Lord, I thank you for those that continue to love and to care in ways that go beyond the norm. So, God, I ask you this morning that you call up those that feel it's time for them to go a little further. Lord, I ask that you call up those that have been wrestling to get close to you, to start getting close to you, Lord, to make those phone calls, to start engaging with those people around them. God, I ask for an awakening that can happen this week. That even in the midst of a pandemic, Lord, your kingdom keeps moving. Lord, even in the midst of the craziness and the world that we live in, that your kingdom will keep moving. God, I ask that you build us up to be a church that goes and doesn't wait for people to come to us. Lord, I ask that you build us up as a body, that we get used to messy. Lord, that we get used to people being different, that, Lord, we get used to different cultures. And, God, I ask that you fill our spaces and our environments around us with people that don't know you, so we get to talk about you. And, God, I think about those that do know you, that feel lost and disconnected. So, Lord, if there are people in our lives that do know you but feel lost and disconnected from the body or from you. Lord, give us the words, give us the spaces, give us the insights to talk to them directly. Lord, don't have us phone a friend, but Lord, have us be that friend. God, equip us, build us, and show us, Lord, how we can be your son on a daily basis. We give all this to you in your awesome, holy name. And all God's people said, Amen.